to step into it again. Because <laughs> your foot's changed. You know, so, so that view that everything is flowing in time uh, makes it hard for us to kind of uh, conclude exactly what uh, object might be stable enough for us to call it an object, whether it's the river or the foot or yourself, right? So you end up with um, uh, a hypothesis that you have a self. Uh, I think another individual that takes the same point of view is Doug Hofstetter. In fact, the, the neat thing about the picture on this book, this, this is old enough that it was thrilled with the new uh, video cameras that had come out, uh, and he was able to plug the camera into the TV so that you could see kind of the feedback uh, from the camera to the TV and back again so that he stuck his hand in front of the camera and you could see the feedback as it moves. <laughs> And you know, that became the picture he picked for the, the cover. And, and he's arguing that I'm a strange loop in sort of the computer sense. You know, if we're trying to create an artificial intelligence that's um, capable of being like a human intelligence, um, what exactly is a human intelligence then if we're trying to imitate it, right? Well, uh, apart from other things, I, I would say the main difference between a computer uh, and people is that people have kind of a social intelligence. We're interacting with other people. I've never really seen a computer interact with other computers in that same kind of social sense. So I, I, I take the side that will argue that we'll never see an artificial intelligence that act actually acts like a human being, you know, because they don't have that same kind of social as socialized inter interaction with other people, nor do they have goals and things, right? Computers do what you tell them to do, uh, basically, uh, instead of coming up with their own ideas so far, right? Um, but so this, this idea that, that we're a strange loop, that we're constantly um, getting feedback from what our feelings are or what we're experiencing, that's being monitored by our own uh, uh, different parts of our brain and, and we're trying to man maintain our, our homeostatic uh, health, you know, our, our temperature or standing upright or eating uh, what we're, when we're hungry, all that stuff, right? Uh, but in any case, uh, there you go. In a strange loop, what do we mean by a persistent self? Um, but there are three aspects of what David Hume feels are, are shared. Uh, one is that we see resemblances in our experience. So we see things that you know, same color, same shape, uh, same uh, um, you know, twins, you know, two kids that look exactly alike. You know, I saw a stupid joke in the paper on Sunday. Uh, the uh, Frankenstein and Frankenstein's wife, you know, the one with the white stripes in the hair, uh, standing with a baby carriage, and someone's looking in the carriage, and Mrs. Frankenstein says, he has his father's nose, and you look at, at Frankenstein, and he's got no nose, and, and a bandage across where his nose had been. Ha ha. You know, so family resemblance, you know, they look similar. Um, one of my favorites was uh, the Pilgrim family. Years ago, uh, there was a family that had moved up from Texas in a van. Uh, it was a husband and wife, Papa Pilgrim, and um, Country Rose was her name. Uh, and they had 21 children. And they all looked exactly alike except for their size difference, right? So, and, and some were male and some were female, but you looked at their faces and you could see they, they looked just like their mother. Uh, family resemblance, right? Uh, that kind of 
you know, get the feeling that you have when you see they're clearly related. <clears throat> so there's resemblance. And you have to wonder, well, how do we see things that resemble one another? Uh, because colors, say, say everything in that uh, exhibition is a blue painting, right? It's a square and blue, and, and the artists use the same blue color you know, in each painting, right? So it's hard to tell even why one painting is different than another. Uh, they're all blue. And you think, well, what's making them all resemble one another as, as far as their blueness is concerned? Well, they, they have the same blue color. Okay, well, what makes that same blue color the same as that one over there? If it's exactly the same, then what you're, you're telling me is that there's something that's exactly the same that's in two separate places. And that doesn't seem possible. You can't have the exact same thing in two separate places. So you basically break it down and say, well, it's the pixels on this picture are blue, and the pixels on this one are blue, and that's why it looks blue. OK, well, then you're telling me that the blue pixels are the same. And does that mean that the blue pixels are in multiple places? The exact same pixel is in more than one place? That's contradictory. You can't have something that's in more than one place. It's exactly the same. That's like physics, right? You don't have that. Um, you can't have the same particle in the same place. Um, you can't have the same particle in two places, right? Uh, so how do we end up having resemblance? Uh, and by the way, that ends up with us not ever solving it. It's one of those infinite problems, because if you keep going down further and down further and saying it's the way that those pixels interact with the light with our eyes, well, that's still something that has to be exactly the same for us to determine that it's exactly the same, etc. So that's a problem for us. So we can't really solve the problem of resemblance. And that leads to problems with identity and all kinds of other things of that sort. The next thing he says that's the same in, in our experience is contiguity in time and space. So obviously in time, it's you know, when two things happen almost simultaneously. You know, uh, you know talk about uh, Einstein's, you know, looking at the train falling, you know, and the things happening on this side of the train and things on this side of the train, you know, or, you know, are, are they happening simultaneously in, in theory of relativity? No, there's no such thing as simultaneity. Um, um, but at, at the same time and space, we feel like there is simultaneity, but you end up with the same problem that you have with the resemblance in trying to explain why you end up with something contiguous in time and space. Because of course we're, we're receiving all these impressions, but what gives us the sense that some impressions are attached to other impressions? What gives them their proximity in time? And of course in space, it's you know, the same issue with space, you know, these ta tables and chairs, you know, whatever you want to talk about, they all look like they're contiguous in space. But what gives us that impression because we're receiving impressions, but we don't know how to explain the connectivity between them. And the third one is cause and effect, which we've already talked about. Uh, it turns out it's based on our memory. Now, when you look at David Hume's arguments, <coughs> he moves on and talks about things as a typical person of his time, explaining morality and things of that sort. So he's clearly not being influenced by his own criticism of uh, philosophy. Uh, so what he's using all of these critiques for is critiquing those philosophers who think they've solved all these problems. And he's basically pointing out, ha ha, you don't really have proof of any of this stuff. See, there's a weakness to all of that. And as a result, it's not proven. But at the same time, he's very practical. So he's not serious about you know, we shouldn't believe that we have a self. It's not serious about believing that there's not objects out there that are causing our perceptions and so on. He's just using this as a way of defeating philosophers that think otherwise. So he's actually very, very practical. But part of what he does 
Uh, um, here's the is ought problem. I should do this. Um, this is, is actually considered to have defeated the idea that we can incorporate ought or value into our arguments uh, up until David Hume, and still for many people, uh, when you're arguing about values and things, you could certainly argue that there are clear values. This is clearly moral. It's a moral issue. Uh, and some of us are being moral and some of us are not, right? Um, uh, so there are those folks that actually believe, for historically absolutely excellent reasons, that there are sure or factual things about morality. Uh, but what David Hume points out is that if you have an argument, you have a premise, and then you have another premise, and you have a conclusion, and in the conclusion, you conclude you therefore ought to do such and such. Well, it's an invalid argument unless the ought comes from one of the premises. And so the ought has to be in a valid argument in one of the premises, which means that one of your premises is an ought statement, which means that you have to have scientific evidence for it, for it to be a fact. And the trouble is uh, that um, such value can't be determined. It's based on subjective opinion, right? Uh, even those folks that feel absolutely certain that there's a mor moral point of view uh, and you're not following it, uh, that's their subjective point of view. And clearly, the person who disagrees with them isn't subject to that same point of view. So if what we're looking for is agreement with all the fluent speakers uh, in a particular form of life, talking about a particular situation, and agreeing that, yes, we all agree that that is this, X. Well, there's individuals out there that won't agree with it, and as a result, value statements are neither true nor false. They're your, uh, um, your emotional attachment to a particular point of view, right? And different people can have different emotional attachments. Notice that also is part of his idea that it's the community uh, that raises you, that gives you a sense of what's right and wrong. What's beautiful? What kind of song is a beautiful song? And so on. So, his writing in at least the second version of his book is what woke Immanuel Kant. From his rationalist slumbers. And a famous, that's what he says himself in one of his texts. In uh, the prolegomenon. Probably described in here somewhere, but notice there's there's overlap. Uh, Hume was born in 1711, Kant 1724. Um, he is going to um, live longer. Uh, he lives, I think, until of 79. Notice, uh, so he lives. Uh, um, 1804, so what's that, 28 years? I re am I doing math correctly? He lives 28 years after Hume dies. Um, and yet they're close. There's a, a bit of an overlap. Um, and he does read um, David Hume's work, although it's already too late for him to write to David Hume and respond to him. But in reading David Hume's work, he ends up, recognizing that Hume has been a significant philosophical player here because with his arguments, especially that about cause and effect and the problem with resemblance and the problem, uh, you know, those problems that we were just discussing, you end up not being able to do metaphysics 
if there's nothing there apart from the impressions we're, that we're receiving at the moment, then there's no grounds for us to basically argue metaphysical arguments. In other words, David Hume has succeeded in destroying the ability to do the kind of philosophy that basically we've done ever since Aristotle, or even earlier, right? What were they all doing? They were all looking for what Kant refers to as the 